that of all the things that Jesus said and did, most often, more than not, people recall <clears throat> when they're not a Christian, the Sermon on the Mount, more than they know other things that Jesus said. They can remember the Beatitudes. They can remember to love your enemies. They remember the way that Jesus portrayed what we ought to be. And they have heard the term Sermon on the Mount. They have heard these things said and these words exemplified in poems and in credos and in thoughts. But, you know, within the Christian church, often, when it's separated from the impact of what God is saying to us, sometimes it loses importance because this is when Jesus made the definitive division between Judaism and the law and the reality of obeying God as the Son of God gave us his authority by which he was speaking. Because he said, or the people said, I should say, in testimony about what he said to them who were listening, he said that he taught them as one having authority. What that means to a Jew was that he spoke as though this is what I'm saying to you. This is my words to do. Because at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, he spoke and said that not everyone that came to him and said, Lord, Lord, have I not done these things in your name? And he said, I'll, I'll say to you, depart from me if you're a worker of iniquity. And he said that the person who does these things, I would liken unto a man who builds his house upon a rock, and that when the storms came, it didn't fall. Jesus was trying to make a point here. These are his sayings. These are his teachings. This is his way. This is his halachot. This is the way that he talked about when he said, I am the way. You want to know what Jesus' words are and what they mean, you have to examine them daily, talk to him in reality, and ask him personally what it applies to you in your life. And that's why we take the Sermon on the Mount in pieces as a devotional or devotional time, because we want to know what Jesus said, because it's easy to make it religious. Anybody can make a religious law. We could say, oh, you know, every Monday we need to go to a Monday study, or every Wednesday we need to go to a community thing, or every Thursday we need to do this or that or the other thing. But what did Jesus say, and what is he saying to you? In the Sermon on the Mount, it is a sermon not for only the disciples, because in the beginning, in Matthew chapter 5, it says, And seeing the multitude, he went up unto a mountain, and when he was set, his disciples came to him. That's good. So we think and assume it's for his disciples. But then when you get to the end of the chapters, in verse 7, we see that, And it came to pass, when Jesus had ended these sayings, the people were astonished at his doctrine. The people heard his disciples came unto him, but the people heard what he had to say. Because it wasn't directed at only a select few, it was directed to you and to me. It was meant to be something that we must learn and apply to our lives as God gives us his inspiration to know that he is speaking, not then, but now. That he is directing the attention to you and to me. In the Beatitudes, we know them usually by heart. Some people can quote them from chapter 5, verse 3, all the way down to, sometimes they say verse 11, sometimes they add 12. But the point is, is that each one is contained with a very important and impactful message that God is saying to you. He is saying in the first one that blessed are the poor in spirit, and we saw that previously, how people are and recognize and should know that they are the poor in spirit, that no matter how righteous you may think you are, you're not. Not when you compare yourself to all these sayings that are contained in what Jesus said on the mountaintop that he spoke from. So when we look at verse 4, it says, Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. People mourn for lots of reasons. I know 
when a person loses a job, there's a sense of mourning that goes on that they just feel as though their world had ended. When a loved one dies, there's a mourning process that in Judaism was very, very prescribed. You would get together and there would be a time set aside for wailing to God over the agony of the loss of a loved one that was in the home. But there was also later ascribed to that same process of mourning a very beautiful prayer that was given that was more of a a praise to God for the life that was lived. We call it saying Kaddish. We call it giving a blessing for the life that was shed or taken and now it's gone. And unfortunately, it isn't a Kaddish, or it isn't a prayer, it isn't a blessing that contains Jesus in it. But it is something that Jewish people do when someone is dead, and they remember the person's death yearly by saying Kaddish for them, in remembrance of God, who gives life and takes life away. In likewise manner, in Jewish custom and tradition, it was always a perspective that when you woke, you thank God for the day. When you arose, you thank God for the clothes he gave you to wear. When you did certain actions, you were given a blessing to repeat in what some would say a vain tradition, some would say a repetitious, dogmatic way, and others would say a lifestyle choice to acknowledge God in it so that God would be with it so that you could do it in his holiness. So if you took it from a bigger perspective, you could see what the intent is, but it was done without the content of a real and living God. Now, God honors it. Don't make a mistake. God honors the faith of his people as they choose to seek him with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength. But he doesn't tell them that they have to or are required to do these things that they added to the law of Moses. Because Jesus came and said, these sayings of mine, I will tell you what to do. And so the blessing that he gave was a shock to the people. He added something and made a new way of looking at something that most people would wail and mourn over or recognize that, oh my God, the person is gone. But he said, no, blessed are they that mourn. He made a brecha, he made a blessing out of the mourning process. He said, it must become a source of rejoicing because you are recognizing the process of mourning and identifying with the loss that you've incurred because God created life. And now that life has been moved someplace distant from you that you do not know. And yet, Jesus said, you will know hereafter. And so he said, for they shall be comforted because God never intended for us to remain in mourning. He wants us to recognize there's a certain process that we're going through that does cause us to mourn, that we do agonize, even as God agonized himself over the death of his son. But the process was brought to rejoicing when he raised his son from the dead, and they were restored in relationship. And bringing in that relationship brought all of us by faith who have been brought into the fellowship with God because of that mourning that God had to endure himself, God the Father mourning for the loss of his son. And yet he was comforted. How? By the very fact that they were raised from the dead. Oh, so we don't have to mourn over the loss of life? We don't have to treat death as though it were a termination and an ending. We can say to ourselves that we will be comforted because when the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, has come, He will cause us to be restored to a relationship with God, that we could have the knowledge and the recognition like Jesus had, that though they may die and be absent for a season, they shall be resurrected in the end of days to either judgment or blessing. So God spoke to those who were so mindful of mourning over the loss of something that was in their life, of a loved one 
but more so also to those people who saw in that day the loss of a holy nation to an unrighteous country that was occupying them. He knew that they mourned for the days when God was living and alive and in them and with them. And they were no longer the people of God, but they were the people seeking after God. And they knew it. Because when Messiah was to come and they were looking for him, he would restore Israel to its former glory. Is your life like that? Were you once more in love with God than you ever were before? Did you not have at one time a fire that burned inside that you wanted to do everything for God? And now, sadly, when you see others or when you consider your old ways, you're mourning over the loss of the fervent love that you had for God at one time. You'll be comforted. You will. Because guess what? If you're mourning, it's tricky. Think about this. If you're mourning, you're blessed. Because here's the reality. God wants you to recognize there's something missing. God wants you to recognize there's something more. God wants you to agonize that in mourning, you're reaching out for something that's beyond what you're feeling at the moment. That you can have something greater than what you're feeling in that instant of mourning. That you recognize that you could have so much more of God which is why you are blessed, because the Holy Spirit was to come, and he would give you comfort. There is only one comfort that comes from God, and that's by way of his Holy Spirit. He sends the comforter to us to convict us of sin, but also to bless us with peace, with love, with joy, with restoration, with a process of knowing God in a more intimate way than we've ever known him before. So Jesus saw that and he said, look, I know you're mourning now. I know you want the nation to be restored. I know you want your life to be restored. I know you want the Messiah now. I know you want the end of days now. I know you want the world to end. I know you want all things to be brought together in love with the Father. Good. I'm glad you feel that way. You're blessed because you do because that's how I feel. I am mourning. And I am comforted. Because I have the Holy Spirit inside me. I have the Comforter. And I'm speaking these words to you that what I have, I will give to you. You shall be comforted. For I will comfort you. I am a comforter to all those who mourn. And so Jesus said, Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. That is what Jesus said. Would you let him do exactly today what he would for you? Would you let him comfort you? If you would, then mourn and recognize that there's a blessing in it. There's a brecha to be made. There's an opportunity to be experienced in exactly what Jesus said.